600 million Africans are digitally excluded. Even if an internet-connected device is handed out to every single African, a major limitation still exists. Only 1% of African languages are fully digitized. This means that many Africans continue to struggle to interact, create, trade, and solve problems. By combining tacit African knowledge with artificial intelligence, we've got that covered. In 10 years, we are digitizing 100 key African languages that will be spoken by 1 billion people in 2031. This will enable local solutions to age-long challenges confronting communities across Africa, leading to a localized boost in education, healthcare, financial inclusion, and security. Join us in making this a reality. We are Sedial, digitizing local, localizing digital. We have Oyela King on more level, the manager, brand manager for Stambik IBTC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Oyela King. And then finally, we have our very own founder, um, Yinka Ying Olako. <laughs> Can we give a round of applause for Yinka? And we also want to say welcome to those joining us online who cannot be here physically. Um, we recognize your presence. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. So this is Yinka, Yadi, and Oye Lacking. Okay, so Yinka, I'm sure like I mean, like the idea of Cidel, like you're one of, you're the pioneer of Cidel, and you had like, you, you, you understood like most of the problems that I've mentioned, like how do you explain that you have 2,000 indigenous languages and like just 1% of those languages are featured in the tech ecosystem. So it looks like a lot of problem, you know, it's like there's so much of problems for us to deal with, but how do you think, like how can we digitize local languages and change the ecosystem, you know, to ensure that um, local language is featured within the ecosystem? All right, thank you very much. Um, good morning all, thanks for being here. And it's important that you, you've been able to join us. Why we've um, put this together and this community together is because no matter how um, education has permeated our nation and for how long it has, there are still more uneducated people than educated people. Now, many things have been tried, but have local languages been tried? Now, and that spirals off into every single thing because it, it starts from education. This year is a voting year. It goes to, you know, democracy and choosing the right person. If you're not educated, you won't choose the right person. It goes to your health care. If you're not educated, you can't find appropriate information or you'll be misinformed about your own health, you know, and, and then food, eating right and living right. Before we even go into technology, can people access quality, up-to-date information um, when they can't speak English or in other parts of the, the, um, the continent when they can't speak French? You know, the answer is no. So it has to be second-hand information. And you know what happens when they say, um, if I say something to you and we say it down the line and I ask the person at the end of the room, what I said, it would have changed. So how can people find quality information? And I will quickly go to the problem. Um, growing up, uh, I grew up in a Yoruba family, and at a certain age, they told me not to speak Yoruba, that Yoruba was vernacular. Now, looking back today, they were wrong. My parents were wrong. I, I, I would look them in the eye and tell them that, because the reason they said that was they felt that the indigenous language would affect how I speak English, right? I don't know if I have an accent, but if I do, what's wrong with my accent? I'm African anyway, right? So we have to push, you know, our indigenous languages just so that um, we can help not only ourselves, but we can help people who um, suffer from the inequalities of our society, women, children, you know, um, children that are out of school in this country alone run into tens of millions, right? So. Will indigenous languages break that barrier? And thankfully enough, the Creative Society has been one of the retainers, you know, to propagate our culture. And, and thankfully, Yadi is here. She's in the creative um, industry. And they always find a way to propagate our culture. But, but then, how do we fix it? And 
our style of fixing it is using technology, and it's the first time ever where there's adequate technology to not only store our languages, but also to propagate it so that everybody can participate. Imagine if you could speak your about to the Siri on your phone. Imagine if you could set timers, if you could set calendars, if you could send emails in your local language. Now, you might not be proficient in that, but through technology, a lot of people who are currently speakers can learn more about their languages, and furthermore, it can expand to people who can only speak that language, and through technology and artificial intelligence, that's what we're trying to do at the Center for Digitization of Indigenous African Languages. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks a lot, Yenke, for sharing that perspective. It's amazing how your right is vernacular, you know. And I'm sure like everyone can relate to that. It's like pidgin as well was vernacular English. You know, no one would allow you to speak pidgin in, you know, a very, in, in quote, like a same environment. But that's our language. You should own our culture, like you had said. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, Oyelakin, I would love to hear from you because you're in the banking sector. And there's been like recently, over the last like five years, there's been like this push for financial inclusion and all of that. All of all those narratives being pushed by different, you know, banking in the banking industry generally. But how do you ensure that you like the message about financial inclusion gets to people at the bottom of the pyramid? I'm talking about people in rural areas that do not speak in English. So what has Tambig been doing, you know, in terms of ensuring information gets to the last mile and information about financial inclusion gets to the last mile? Okay, thank you very much. Um, first, I think we must, I must first um, align with um, what Yinka had said. Um, we're at the brink of um, technological changes and um, the way things would affect us and the way, you know, we move about life. Pardon? The, na the way we would project, uh, like a pardon, the way we would, um, accept these changes is what we generally do not understand. Uh, I say this because, I mean, if you look through from what you have said, uh, what's the inclusion? I think it's, it's, it's basically uh, for everyone to participate and collaborate. That's, that's the first thing we need to get right. Uh, so either from the regulatory aspect or, you know, from the government inclusion part or maybe making policies for all of these things and all of that. Uh, but, you know, having said that, um, the core of the business we do and the promise we try to, you know, fulfill to our clients and customers is um, inclusion. I mean, we're here for business to serve them, regardless of wherever their location is. Um, this could be seen first through a couple of things, uh, through, for example, our corporate and social investment. For our corporate and social investment, we bear it at the core of our mind to say that, you know, we're not doing things, you know, right within your neighborhood where you can see. We make deliberate attempts to go through, you know, the interland to be able to impact on life. So, I mean, so we give back to the society that way, and we expect that obviously they will be also included in the financial sector. So how do we then achieve this? We have a couple of products. Um, the Artis Wallet, which, you know, from anybody who could use just the phone that is not even on the internet can access financial services, you know. So these are basically you looking through, uh, I think it's the hash, hashtag banking or, you know, the USSD codes, I beg your pardon, that's, that's what it is. So that, that in its own creates, you know, financial inclusion. We have products that are specific to people who live in the rural areas, uh, agricultural products, you know, equipment financing. We also do the easy cash where I think you can have uncollateralized uh, loans from between 20,000 up to a maximum of about 4 million. So these are all the ways we try to impact directly on the people who, you know, are within the underserved society and, uh, you know, population for, for, for banking. Awesome. All right, then. Thanks a lot for sharing that perspective. Yinka, do you want to say something about that? Oh, yeah. Um, it's very important. For example, uh, currently, of course, it's, it's widely known that there's no infrastructure to totally reach out to those people. So, you know, what they are doing is laudable to reach out to people, but they would need to have, I'm sure, they have agents in those areas to help those people. So, like you mentioned, the last mile, what, what then would be the next step? Of course, it's not something that you would be able to say off the top of your head here, but what then would be the last mile? In I ran into some of your communications. You guys even um, localize some of your advertising, right? What, so beyond that, how 
and through collaboration, how can we all make sure that it can get into the hands of the person and the person can be educated enough? Because people often say that, uh, I don't like to use the word illiterate. I don't believe that anyone is illiterate. What they are is illiterate in English, but they are very illiterate in whatever language that they're speaking and whatever trade. If he's a fisherman, he's literate about the water. He knows when to ride the tide. He knows when not to. So no one is illiterate. So if we can then cross over and find a way to localize the messaging as they do and even further in all the things that we do, private sector, everywhere, then maybe we can get to that last mile that you mentioned. Yeah, awesome. I think like the key thing we can get from what Oyelaki and Yinka said is collaboration. And that's why we have all of you here today. And you know, after this discussion, we're going to be sharing about how you can be a part of the CDL tribe because everybody has a role to play. You know, even though you can speak very basic, you know, Yoruba, you still have a role to play in ensuring that we're able to expand opportunities to people that do not speak in English, right? And speaking of wit, right, Yadi, I know you've been, you've been doing amazing work with, like, art and even, like, preserving our culture, like your artwork with um, the in DVC um, writing, in CBD, yeah, in CBD um, writing, the very old form of writing. So I want to know what role you, you think the, you know, what role we can take in terms of preserving our cultural artifacts so that we're not, because it's just amazing how that you can really be a Nigerian and not be, like, and not own that tribe. And, the more the generation keeps coming and going, the more we're losing our culture and we be, we're becoming, and then the truth is that no matter where you go to, you're not them. Like, you can stay like 10 years in the US. You're not an American, you know? You may get the papers, but you're not an American. So we need to own our culture. So what role do you think, you know, the people in the art sector can play in preserving culture? Uh, hi, everyone, thank you. Sidal, and thank you, Shona and Yinka, for having me here. Um, so I'm just going to speak a little bit about the project that I did. Um, it was called Language as Material, and I am an experimental artist, and I collaborated with a fashion designer, and uh, the main idea for that project was to educate, was to educate people about African language systems that were long gone and forgotten, and that are also barely in use in today's, in today's age. And so we focused on three main languages. We focused on Bantu, which is from Southern Africa, um, Adinkra, which is from Ghana, and also in CBD, because that was something that we could find was also common to Nigeria as, it's, as, as a space here. And, and what we did was we went into these archives. We chose symbols that we resonated with, just out of free will, but, and also and tried to tell stories with batik fabric, with textile design, and also by creating workshops for people to participate in. Um, something that we really also wanted to do was to make sure that the education aspect of it, outside of the art and like the beautiful stuff, was highlighted. So we made sure to include a digital aspect. And the way that we came up with that was we realized that on our daily like social media and, and communication systems, what's often missing is reference points to like your own particular African history or Nigerian history. You would go on like the Instagram search archive and if you're looking for a GIF, everything is very much like westernized or Europeanized. There is no, there, there are hardly Nigerian faces, Nigerian smileys. You know, you don't see any of those things online for use. And it's very important to be able to interact with digital media in any form and be able to recognize yourself in it, right? So we decided to make a sticker set which we made available for people to download on their WhatsApp and also on their iMessages for people to, to, to just communicate with. And that's just one step, right? Let's begin to actually use this thing in instant messaging. What does that look like and feel like? Let's get people get, to get used to that idea of, you know, using things that are historic to them. And yeah, so there's that. Um, I think that something that's really important for artistic practice is documentation and, you know, and, and archiving. And it's a big part of just what motivates my general practice. I'm self-taught, so I've had to rely a lot on researching and trying and checking on the internet for things and checking on like digital spaces just to get information to inform my practice. And um, recently I had collaborated with uh, two artists and we had made this project called Lead from the Land. 
and it was basically an experimental residency, online residency program that lasted for about six weeks. And what we were basically doing was studying cultural food practices in our respective home countries. I was a Nigerian in there and there was a Zambian in there. Now there was no particular template for which we could like, you know, document. We didn't have like, oh, this is the thing that we're going to do. But we decided to have conversations, record those conversations, give ourselves tasks each week, each week. Okay, what did you eat today? What does that look like? Um, where you're from? What is the main common meal there? How are you interacting with that? And we ended up, you know, just collecting all this information over six weeks and then hosting it on a website space that's also available to still view. So, like, we, the, the idea basically is that you are using your art form as a means to constantly document and you're also making sure that it is represented online in digital space, on the, on the internet, where there is also easier access for it. Because you can do things like make exhibitions, but then you have a limited amount of people who can access those spaces. But in terms of what the internet is, it's open, right? It's open and it is not particular. The, the, the hierarchy isn't, you know, a lot. And there aren't like gatekeepers on the internet. You can just click on the website, go, and then have access. So yeah, that's something that we're trying to push with the work. Awesome. I really love the idea about, you know, the GIF, like in local, like with our local staff, you know, it's really exciting. Um, and it's just really good, like seeing how, because oftentimes when we want to talk about culture, we're talking about going to one museum, right? But it's just really cool how that you're trying to bring all of all those things like to the digital space. So you're not necessarily, because like when you go to the museum, you you come out more depressed. You're like, oh my God, why is the government not taking care of this place, right? So it's just really cool how that you're using the digital space, you know, to communicate about culture. So amazing work there. You know, one thing that Oye Lakin said was the need for collaboration. So collaborating with people, everybody has a role to play. And he also said something about the need for policies and government. And I, I mean, I don't need to put you on the spot, Yinka, but you're one person that has worked with the government. I mean, like your work with the NESG and, you know, over the years. So how do you think we can get the government involved in this? Because, for example, if we don't have a national policy that makes, you know, indigenous communicating in indigenous language compulsory or something it's like it's like an end to no like it's like we're not heading anywhere right it's like for example when we talk about the disabled like people with disabilities like there are certain policies that have been introduced to ensure that you know some organi organizations sort of employ or have like a disability policy so in terms of indigenous language how do we ensure that we get the government buy-in you know, to ensure that we have content or and narratives that are in local languages? Okay, that, that's a very good question. And, um, you know, because of multiple hats that I wear. But let me start from here. Policy reform is a long process, right? And you have to do a lot of due diligence and do the right thing. I would say for us to get, you know, an indig indigenous language policy, you know, that is robust enough, you know, it would take time. But what are we doing about it? Because we talk about the government. One is about to go out, another set will come in. The people make up the government. So what are the people doing? Um, are we a force big enough to push for such a policy? And is this institution, you know, a force that can push for that, that policy? You know, the jury is still out of, uh, on that. So how do we look at it? Do we look at it as um, half empty or half full? Uh, we have to start from here. Let me ask a question from everyone in the audience. Uh, if you speak more than one language, raise your hand. OK. That's the bulk of the audience. I believe that every Nigerian, especially every Nigerian that lives in the urban or suburban area, speaks probably three languages, right? Maybe English or any version of it um, that you speak. The next one is you come from an ethnic group. And even if you can't speak it fluently, um, sometimes when you wake up or when you are oversleeping, you hear it ringing in your ears, your mother or your father saying that you're being lazy. So there's a voice in your head that speaks that Urobo or that Ijo or whatever language. And then the third one is Pidgin. And Pidgin is very important. 
so for us to have an indigenous language policy, I believe that um, all the languages, whether they are original or forms of it, because if you look at Swahili, Swahili came from Arabic, right? It's a fusion of Arabic and other languages. So if you look at Pidgin, it's English and Hausa when you say Wahala, and Yoruba when you say Oga, and many, many, many other languages. So it's a fusion. So in that language policy, we might need to have Pidgin as a well-recognized language. But this has been tried before. In the 90s, early 90s, based on my research, they tried to do something called Wazobia, right? Create a language that was a fusion. He died a premature death. Why? Because there are 200 other languages or 400 other languages in Nigeria. So you would choose Wazobia is Aosa Ibo Yoruba. You will choose those three and forget my language, right? No, we're going to scatter it. So that language policy has to be inclusive, right? It has to recognize everybody. And they couldn't achieve it then because there wasn't enough research, there wasn't enough technology. And it takes me back to what the solution can be, which is machine learning and artificial intelligence, using it to not only learn our oral language, right, which most of our languages are, only a few can be written, but also signs and semiotics, like in CBD, like you've mentioned. Even our hand signs, you know, Nigerian hand signs are different, right? Um, this means something, right? So recognizing those kind of signs and putting it in can solve a lot of problems. You know, healthcare, education, financial, even security problems. If there was enough technology base to, say for example, listen to calls, Maybe we can solve some problems in the north instead of shutting down telephone masts. Maybe we can listen to those calls and ident identify challenges through keywords and intercept you know, those, um, those terrorist attacks or whatnot. So technology and language is at the center of everything we want to do. And let me um, go to other people apart from government and even us ourselves working as a coalition. Other people have um, a role to play not for profits, especially those pushing the SDGs. The SDGs, they're 17 in number. Uh, maybe you know them, but how does somebody who's in a local area, how, how, how do they know the SDGs and what to do? We talk about climate action as one of those SDGs. Whatever you do in, in Lagos, if everybody is compliant, what happens just outside Lagos where they do not understand it? So, not for profits need to adopt localization into their communication that makes it inclusive. Um, apart from that, private sector needs to adopt it into you know, their outreach programs. Everything that they put out, they need to adopt localization into it. And um, even tech companies as they're coming up, because um, localizing your content, localizing your tech platform could open you up across Africa to your next one billion customers. But if you do not embody localization, we we'll all just be fighting for the same 40 million customers. And then what happens after some time? So that's my perspective to it. And I've mentioned private sector, um, individuals, um, the government, you know, and every other, everybody has to have a buy-in because we've skipped many processes. It now looks like we have to track back and fix it just so that we can take that quantum leap into the future that we desire for Africa. Thanks a lot, Yinka, for sharing that perspective. So, Oyelakin, is there something, like having heard all of this, you know, is there something you're taking back, you know, to improve how, you know, digital, like financial inclusion is being done and ensuring that it really, really gets to, like, people at the bottom of the pyramid? Like what Yinka mentioned, having a USSD code, if the means of the language for communicating is still in English, then that means we've not done enough, you know, in ensuring that it reaches the last mile. So are there other things that you plan to do or stand big plans to do in ensuring that information and opportunities get to the last mile? Um, thank you very much. Um, okay, so as we're speaking here, I just tried to look through and, you know, I was checking something on the global info information infrastructure space. Making a case for language inclusion, for example, sits base, base, base of the pyramid. I mean, I'm a little bit surprised at what I see here, but you know. Um, having said all of that, we had looked and um, it's still the policies, right? Uh, on our own, we operate in 20 African countries, either as Stambik IBT or as a standard bank. 
And if you go through, and I recall an experience in Malawi, for example, so if you go through and you look through all the marketing communication equipments that are sent out, or communications that are put out in Malawi, for example, there's nothing in English. If you go into your workspace, everybody speaks the local dialect. So I'm coming from Nigeria, I'm working into an office in Malawi. I, I kind of, I'm a bit lost. They understand English. English is the official language, but yes, they, they pride in what they own. Um, so when I say that we need to speak of inclusion, and it's, it's, it's you and I, it's everybody, you know, uh, I've been fortunate or, you know, lucky to be at the NESG and at the last one, I'd worked with uh, Yinka as a volunteer on one of the committees. And you look that, you know, if you want to push through government policies in Nigeria, it takes time and time and time. And, you know, arriving at the last team for, for, for that, you know, you see, so what am I saying in essence? In essence, I'm saying that we will do our own and we'll continue to do our own because we've identified these problems, you know. We try to get to these people because, like Yinka had mentioned earlier, um, the unbanked or the semi-literate who are not formally educated in English are more than all of us who are around these tables here. So those are the people who are the real market deciders and add to, you know, how do I put it, the, the non-captured gross domestic income of Nigeria. So if I had a mechanic, for example, who sits down there in Oshobo and he's good at what he does, it does not mean he's an illiterate. It just means that he's not speaking English and he probably doesn't just believe in the banking theory. But when I put my message to him in a, a language, he would understand, you know, and I said to, I mean, I was having a chat with one of my colleagues when I said I was coming here earlier today. And I said, you know, identifying the problem really goes a long way. I had a grandmother who passed at the age of 98, maybe like about seven years ago, you know. She bought a Yoruba newspaper every morning. She could read, she could write, like, okay, this is what I need to do, this is what I need to do. But she couldn't speak perfect English. I mean, does it make her illiterate? No, if I look back. So these people are those people are, are, are the ones we have in mind as a financial organization and you know uh, we try to put the messages across uh, most of our messaging that we have now are usually translated into the main other languages and obviously if I'm trying to push a product to you in Lagos I want to push the same product in Aba but I believe that you know what has been spoken in Aba is different so I want to come to you to communicate to you for you to understand inclusion further than that uh, would hang on basically, uh, and I'm trying to be careful here, on the regulators, I would say, okay. So if a regulator says to me that, you know what, you have 20 branches in the north, how many languages do you have in the north? The three major languages that top up in the north, they have to be included in your forms. I mean, it's, it's a way that says to you that this is what you must do. So the way and the part has to be shown. And that's why I say that beyond, you know, you and I, there's the government part, there's a the regulatory part, and if it's not mandatory, you know, there's, there's, there's really nothing to be done. Let, let, me, let me hang in there. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Ayn. I can, and then, like, yeah, I would love to hear from you, especially, like, what you plan to do, because you've already done some amazing work in Igbo language, but what more do you plan to do, you know, in terms of ensuring that you use, like, experimental um, artifacts to communicate our culture? Um, so I can't escape the fact that I am born in the digital age and I constantly use like digital interfaces and I'm not going to pretend like, oh, I just don't know how to use these things. I think that we all have phones, we all have laptops, um, we all know what websites are as well. So I keep on with my very best making sure that whatever research I'm doing, whatever um, experience it is that I'm having, where, wherever it is that I'm going, all the travel that I'm making within Nigeria, especially to explore culture, especially for projects it is that I'm working on, I am constantly documenting, I'm constantly showing, you know, this is where this is, this is where this belongs. Um, I don't think that with the idea of like digitization, it needs to be anything more complex than just taking a picture, recording yourself, re taking voice notes, just making sure that there is a record of you know, whatever culture it is that you're coming in contact with. And yeah, that's what I really just plan to do as much as possible. I currently run an online um, page on Instagram, which is aside from my own regular page. It's called Of Pure Technical Romance. And it was born out of this idea of just relating with um, technology and digital spaces in a less than functional way. And just, you know, playing around with 
the ideas of cropping and screenshotting and GIFs and images to make sure that, okay, me as a Nigerian creator, I'm here interacting with this space. Like, I'm not lost from that conversation, but I need to have a digital exhibition with um, foreign organizations. I can't participate in that conversation. So by just constantly educating myself as well. Awesome. Thanks, a lot. Um, I know we're pressed for time. Yinka, do you have, like, any final words just before we wrap up? Okay. Um, I would like to thank... Um you know, obviously, Yadi and um, Oyelaki, you know, for how, how they've contributed to the conversation. And, and that has, you know, helped me even think further. I'm sure it has enlightened you on, you know, what we can do and do better to, to push this narrative. And we are doing our own part. Currently, um, if you're watching us online, we have interpreted in House Iban Yoruba. I'm sorry if we couldn't do your language. We're hoping, right? And that's why we're hoping that um, we'll be able to create a community, what we like to call a tribe, where everyone here, everyone listening to us digitally can join in and together we can digitize our local languages just so that we can localize digital access, right? Just so that when anybody is listening to whatever speech, whatever campaign, you know, they will be able to get the information in local languages. And the, the impact will be amazing because, think about it, people getting the information live and direct, and then they will become more inquisitive and think about more things, and um, we'll be able to embody this movement, and they'll become advocates. So we're asking you to join us. So what's the call to action? What's the outcome from this conversation that we're trying to have? We're, trying, we're asking you to join us. We can't do it all by ourselves, no matter how fast the machine is, no matter if we use the biggest supercomputer in the world, Right? Somebody still has to teach it the language. And it's not written down in many books. There aren't many books. It's in your mind. Right? It's in your head. It's in what you've learned all the years of your life. So join us. Um, we, we've got um, a link. We'll have the link up there. Um, go to our website, cdil.co slash tribe, and sign up. Choose the languages that you love, even if you can't speak them. Right? Some other people will train the machine to learn the languages, and then you would be able to learn from it. And we have a good point system, recognizing every contribution that you have to us, the program. So please join us. And uh, we hope that together we will be able to take Africa into a better place than we met it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So questions? Okay. So there's one there. Any other question? We can, there's two. We can take three. Any other person? Okay. So one and two. Thank you very much. And after that, we can have the video if the video is ready. Okay. Hi, everybody. So, great work. Great. Um, this is all good. But we have been talking about indigenous languages, and I, I've been hearing English since. <laughs> so, I would just like us to play a little game. I love games. So, starting with the panelists and our moderators, say something in an indigenous language. I'll go first. So, Inasonchi Abunchi. I am Yoruba, by the way. I just said I want to eat food. I'm actually hungry. <laughs> so, I would like if everybody can participate. You know, let's just have this language going on. So, just say something and translate. So, over to you guys. Because the English was just too much. I was like, where am I? Thank you, guys. Okay, we'll do the game just after the question. Good afternoon. Thank you, panelists. Um, great ideas. And I'm excited, especially um, at the fact that you're trying to um, digitize the local languages. But what comes to mind? Plenty of questions. But because of time, I'll just narrow it down to three. First, to CIDAL. So um, I'm thinking with all this um, initiatives and project programs I see, um, I'm not seeing the excluded really being factored in. Because if we're saying digital, please, the excluded people are still within the 2G region. Yes, it's di digital, but the devices 
that are available to them are not even indigenous. So can we also look at the perspective of maybe discussing, seeking collaboration with manufacturers of equipment, and probably we can have um, devices that are indigenously um, manufactured. Our alphabet, for instance, we, I know in the, some Arabic nations, the um, feature phones have Arabic alphabet on the phones. What happens? Then for the financial inclusion, Mr. Stanbeek, um, I know that the banks are running away from brick and mortar. When you say regulators, whatever the regulators say also plays a factor. Yes, but have you also looked at the issue of trust? Because that's one of the persistent um, challenges for not achieving financial inclusion. The last um, target was 80%, which was not achieved. But the trust factor, because if you're not speaking to me in the language I understand, if you're not bringing products that um, is aligned to my culture, that may also serve as a barrier, which is still persisting. Then finally, to the beautiful lady, um, my thought is this. When it comes to um, artifacts, is there a need for us to sensitize people, because sometimes we frown at anything indigenous. We also have the issue of religion, which is the opium of the people. Sometimes we see traditional things as, no, it's against my religion. How do we resensitize in this movement? Above all, fantastic um, project. Well done. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, Yali, do you want to start? So, I mean, I feel like this issue of like religion and traditional artifacts is like it's a constant conversation. Um, but I strongly believe that anything that's part of your history shouldn't be overlooked. Like anything that is coming from you shouldn't be overlooked. You might not practice it. You may not like bring it into your everyday now. But it's important to make sure that it is highlighted for reference because something that's happened to us in recent times, and this is post-colonial era, and we're still struggling to figure out, okay, who we actually were, where it is that we actually came from. So we can't afford to demonize ourselves um, because I think for the large part of what religion is, it is also something that's come from a different space and we've accepted it into our, into our space. I don't know if I'm being like controversial about it, but we have to make sure that it is, that, that, that what remains important is that you recognize that as history, and then you keep, it, you, you, you keep the value of making sure that it, it goes into your museums, it goes into spaces that it can be found and it can be recognized in, not erasing it completely. So take pictures of it, document it. Maybe we don't practice those same religions anymore. Maybe we don't use those artifacts anymore. But beyond even just traditional worship and whatnot, there is a whole world of culture with clothing, with fabric, with language systems that is still missing and it has still not been addressed and like documented. So yeah. yeah awesome. So. Thanks a lot. What are you lacking? Okay. Um, I'll just quickly hang it from here to say the issue of trust. Um, I believe that Stamic Abilities being an affiliate of a standard bank group belong to a financial institution over 153 years of heritage. That itself is what we try to say to our customers. Moving beyond uh, brick and mortar into you know, the platform businesses which we aim to achieve you know, in a couple of three, four, five more years. Uh, these are the things we're trying to do. And whilst you know, we still have the brick and mortar, I believe that you know, we're putting in people who come in through the agency banking just to ensure that at a time when the brick and mortars are still available, you're getting used to all sort of, you know, um, um, people who can then come to say, okay, I work for this organization, this is what I do, and then, you know, just to make sure that we're bringing banking to your doorstep at your convenience. Um, so that, that's one part of what we're trying to do. Um, so whilst the brick and mortar faces out, yes, it would eventually. Um, we would have been able to, breach, uh, to build that trust, I beg your pardon, simultaneously, such that, you know, when one thing is not there, the other one is there for you. Um, also, we try to, you know, build our confidence and trust. Um, for instance, on our pension business, which is our biggest asset, 
where we hold about you know 3.5 trillion naira in, in in current assets. I mean, I'm sure that you know that. I don't know if you know anybody who uses the uh, stomach habits of pensions, but for instance, you see that on the 23rd of every month, you get paid right on time, you know, and I think on a monthly basis, we pay about 1.8 million pensioners. Um, I think those are, those are things we could always leverage on, you know, to, to, to build that trust and gain the customer's confidence. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Oyelaki. So, Yinka, do you want to just wrap up? Oh, oh yes. Um, that's a very solid question because you, you're thinking beyond what we're saying now. And, of course, it's, it's a 40-minute panel. We can't talk about everything that we have done right now. Asking people to come to our platform, they have to be able to type those local languages that we're talking about and use it. And in our studio, in our, in our studio, our lab, whatever you call it, we have developed keyboards in five of those languages that you mentioned. And but we've developed keyboards with languages that have been codified, which means that languages that, you know, researchers and linguists have come together and said, you know what, this is how you write A, this is how you write R. And the, the alphabets are sort of different from how you write English, right? So we've developed that. But how do we continually develop it? How do we do it for the next 15, 20, 30 languages? I can do it alone. She cannot. So we all have to do it together. That's why we're asking people to come. So from where we create scripts, which is how these languages are typed, then we're already talking to OEMs on collaborating so that devices can come out, like the Arabic ones that you mentioned, that have two keys, the English and then an upper script that is the local languages, and that's in the local language, or the other way around, if you get what I mean. So I'm not sure anyone has seen any, um, that Arabic keyboard before. You can see the Roman English script, and then you can see the Arabic script. So we're working on something, right? And as if you are part of our community, you will constantly get updates on this software and products, right, coming out, accessible to everybody, just so that we aren't blocking access with asking people to pay, but everybody can get access to it, and they can use it to further build the languages, store it, and then amplify it um, for progress in the community. Thank you. Okay, so finally, before I allow um, this amazing panelist to go back to their seat and before we take the picture, so one, say something in a language outside of English and translate it. Just one sentence, starting from Oyelaki. Ekaro. Um, Not Ekaro. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, uh, you're, you're just starting. Yeah. Dukbe loko loko, ti bobo yin wa si biti a joko siloni. Uh, for or tell us what you buy. I do buy low in your work. What does that mean? Okay, so it means I'm just saying thank you to everybody. I greeted first and I said thank you for everyone who came here to sit to listen to this panel session today. Okay, thank you. Yadi. Uh, okay, I'll keep it simple. I have to be a chimma, Ukon Hankalo. I will be on Abia State on half year. I'll leave it at that. What does that mean? My name is Yaduchima Kohankalu. I am from Abia State, Ohafia. Okay. Yinka. Yinka, don't sell us. <laughs> I won't do that. I will push the language that I, um, that I think includes everybody. So, how are they? Good day. I thank Una for. So, Una come here, Una come follow us talk. And uh, I want me to go on that website. The Domot on that website. We could now follow us, they talk. We could now follow us, they interact. And then together, we we'll go reduce the Wahala for this we country. And we we'll go build we country and we continent to take greater heights. Thank you very much. Awesome. Amazing. So I'll just say, Eshe, you know, thank you very much. Uh, we, yeah. <laughs> and now, good day. Guys, digital interaction seems a long way out. But together, Africa will take this quantum leap. Join our community today. We are CDIAL. The journey to localize digital interaction seems a long way out, but together, Africa will take this quantum leap. Join our community today. We are CDIAL, digitizing local, localizing digital.